Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, Happy New Year, and welcome back. Um, we'll go ahead and get started with our seminar. Um, and just a few announcements, though. Uh, for those students who signed up for lunch, um, we'll meet with uh, Travis down here at the front. And remember that there is a class that meets immediately after here, so we need to move on when the seminar is over. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today. Uh, it was a recommendation um, from one of you, so thank you. And if you're interested in recommending anyone, please, I encourage you to do so. Our speaker today is uh, Travis Reynolds. He is a Ph.D. agricultural applied economist uh, with a background in public policy, rural development, environmental issues, and organic farming. He holds the rank of Assistant Professor of Community Development and Applied Economics at the University of Vermont and is a faculty affiliate of the UVM Food Systems Program and a faculty member of the Evans School of, Pub of Policy Analysis and Research Group uh, at the University of Washington. For the past decade, Dr. Reynolds has studied, rela studied the relationships uh, between farm management, economic development, and ecosystem services with an emphasis on poverty alleviation, sustainability, and resilience in low-income smallholder farming communities in Sub-Saharan Africa. With grant funding from the National Science Foundation, U.S. Department of Agriculture, private and philanthropic organizations, Dr. Reynolds has led teams in international and interdisciplinary scholars, um, graduate students and undergraduate students from diverse backgrounds in applied research at the intersection of agriculture, food security, and the environment. Dr. Re Reynolds uh, presently serves on the board of the International Consortium on Applied Bioeconomy Research, and his work has been published in top interdisciplinary and agricultural development journals, including World Development, Journal of Development Studies, Risk Analysis, and Food Security. Let's welcome Dr. Reynolds. Thank you uh, for that introduction. Uh, thank you uh, for the invitation. It's uh, an honor to kick off uh, a new year uh, of seminars. Uh, and it's been intimidating uh, looking back over some of the past seminars uh, that have been delivered uh, in this space. Um, as was just uh, said, my name uh, is Travis Reynolds. I'm an assistant professor of community development and applied economics uh, at uh, the University of uh, Vermont. Uh, today my talk uh, is Ecological, Social, and Economic Enabling Factors for Food Security and Escapes from Poverty in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, a mouthful and a lot of uh, slides. Uh, hang on, this will be fun. First, um, uh, some uh, thanks. Uh, what I'm going to be presenting uh, today are uh, a series of, of, of snapshots of what are really large, ongoing research projects with a lot of collaborators uh, and a lot of support uh, from uh, various directions. Um, so just before uh, diving in, uh, a couple of uh, shout-outs. Uh, some uh, of the work on the ecological side uh, is uh, uh, drawn from uh, my work uh, funded by the National Science Foundation's uh, Research Experience for Undergraduates program, uh, which is a terrific uh, program uh, designed uh, essentially to, to leverage uh, research opportunities in universities that have resources uh, to make more opportunities available uh, to students from backgrounds where they might not otherwise be exposed uh, to research. Uh, so with this NSFRU um, uh, program grant, I had the opportunity to, to bring uh, three uh, cohorts of eight to ten uh, undergraduate students uh, from diverse uh, backgrounds drawn from all across uh, the United States to northern Ethiopia uh, to conduct research on sacred natural sites with uh, church communities. Uh, just extraordinary uh, work. Uh, excited uh, to summarize some of that here. Um, uh, 
uh, some uh, of the uh, work I'll be presenting on uh, seed networks in Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda uh, is uh, work that's been conducted uh, by Bioversity International, uh, which is a consultative group by International Agricultural Research uh, Center, uh, recently joined with another center, CX, um, which is really focused uh, on uh, studying those uh, forgotten or neglected uh, crops. Uh, those non-major uh, commodity grain crops, those other crops uh, that end up being an important uh, part of smallholder livelihoods in so many parts of the world, uh, but are also under-studied, uh, under-researched. Um, so much uh, uh, work has been done uh, in this area by biodiversity. I'll be talking about some work uh, done, uh, led primarily by Gloria Osamel um, out of the Kimpali Uganda office. Um, and then lastly, uh, but decidedly not least, uh, I'll be summarizing some work um, supported by the uh, uh, grant from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation uh, to the Evans School Policy Analysis and Research Group. Um, EPAR uh, is an organization uh, that was founded uh, at the University of Washington uh, by uh, Dr. Lee Anderson in 2008, um, and it's a student-powered uh, research uh, team, uh, master's students, PhD students, postdoctoral students, uh, really going at uh, these uh, complex questions around agricultural development, uh, financial services for the poor, uh, development policy and finance. Uh, and for the past four years, uh, through a grant from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, EPAR has been able to invest heavily in making some of these complex agricultural development data sets, like the World Bank Living Standards Measurement uh, Study, uh, more accessible, uh, more usable for other people by developing code and disseminating those code uh, in the format uh, that really other researchers can hit the ground running uh, to start asking some of these questions with these complex data sets. Um, before I even start, I hope that you will go to the EPAR website, look at these codes, look at uh, these uh, resources, and to the extent possible, apply them in your uh, work. Uh, the goal here is really uh, to make these complex extraordinary data sets more usable, more accessible to broader uh, audiences. I also want to uh, give a shout out to this, uh, which is the view from my family farm in Vermont. Uh, so I grew up uh, in uh, the Northeast Kingdom. Uh, uh, the Northeast Kingdom is the northeastern uh, three counties uh, in the state of Vermont. Uh, it is a, um, a remote, uh, rural, uh, agricultural uh, landscape. If uh, you look at my town, uh, uh, if you look at my town's uh, name in Wikipedia, uh, Standard, uh, Vermont, uh, the entry says, uh, the town of Standard, Vermont is in uh, Caledonia County in Vermont, Northeast Kingdom. The town has no pavement. Period. And that's the whole entry. <laughs> uh, it is an extraordinary place uh, to grow up. I wouldn't uh, trade it for anything. Um, but it's also uh, a remote, uh, low income corner uh, of a rural, uh, not overly wealthy state. Um, so when I uh, was growing up, uh, I, I don't think I even realized that. Uh, we were in a uh, an 800 square foot house <laughs> that was built in 1813 that had six and a half foot ceilings because when you built a tiny farmhouse on a mountaintop in 1813 you weren't thinking about tall visitors. Uh, that you know didn't occur to me that that wasn't normal that you wouldn't come home after school and go to the barn. Uh, for two or three hours uh, listening to Kenny Rogers on the radio and scraping stalls and feeding uh, cows. We were on the WIC program. We were on food stamps. But so was everybody. Uh, the Northeast Kingdom is, is one of the poorest uh, areas, again, in uh, Vermont. That was normal. What I took out of uh, that childhood was not any, any, any sense of, of, of being uh, deprived, actually, it was, a, it, was, it was a sense of, you know, I get to do this. Uh, it's triggering season right now. 
Uh, again, if, if folks haven't had the chance to go up to Vermont and, and, and try sugar beans, really go up to Vermont and try uh, sugar uh, But when I, I think uh, back to what I mean from this kind of an agricultural upbringing, is things like knowing uh, that uh, you pack trees at this time of year, learning about climate science, or with this sort of really applied uh, setting where, where you think about, wow, we have to tap a lot earlier than we used to. Wow, these seasons are a whole lot more unpredictable than they used to be. Uh, other things that you learn about triggering just sort of, you know, passively uh, is you learn good forest management. You learn forestry. You learn managing for firewood. You learn managing for biodiversity. Uh, you learn uh, about how to engage in the actual chemistry of making maple syrup, of boiling that sap that's 2% into that syrup that's 66% sugar if it's by the federal standard or 67% sugar if it's by the Vermont standard. <laughs> yes. Uh, and you learn um, about all of the, the tools and the machinery and the physics uh, you learn about marketing, you learn about website development, you learn about uh, the fact that the price of maple syrup actually has very little to do with production or anything that farmers in Vermont do. It's almost entirely driven by the U.S.-Canada exchange rate because most of the syrup in the world comes out of Canada and most of the price that Vermont farmers face is driven by that international currency market. And so, it, it, again, when I describe what an agricultural upbringing has done, I like to describe it in terms of what uh, my son, um, you know, who's in this previous slide here, he's a bit bigger now, uh, you know, has, has, has possibly taken away from this. And what I think he's taken away from it is an introduction to climate science, an introduction to applied ecology, an introduction uh, to forest uh, management, forestry, um, an introduction uh, to uh, mechanics, uh, and chemistry and physics, an introduction <laughs> to uh, website design and marketing and international finance. And once he had all of those introductions, uh, we started saying, well, you know what? It's time to think about kindergarten. <laughs> it's, it's extraordinary <laughs> what uh, farming does in terms of making you think uh, about things. Uh, in this transdisciplinary, complex uh, way. Uh, and I hope uh, that all of you in a, in a school of uh, food and food policy uh, have opportunities to interact with and work with uh, some farmers. I also recognize uh, that we're pretty lucky in that we are a multi-generational farm and that the kids in this multi-generational farm, myself and my two sisters, we all have graduate degrees. We all ended up doing pretty well. We all now have the ability to choose to leave the farm and pursue careers or to stay on the farm and continue to support that farm or to have one foot in and one foot out. I have to teach tomorrow, but this weekend I will be tapping seats. We get to choose those and a lot of people don't. Uh, I was sitting down with my uh, parents just a, a couple of days ago, and in the space of five minutes, we were able to list off 15 farms that have shut down in just uh, our two, three town area since I was a kid. And these are not farms that chose to shut down. <laughs> these are farms that were trying to make a go at it, trying to make uh, food, trying to pursue the livelihoods that they wanted to pursue, and the context changed, and the economics changed, and the livelihood that they wanted to pursue was no longer viable. So, this talks about Africa. But a lot of what rural households face, a lot of what rural, small farm households face is similar no matter where you are. These are, these are, these are questions and challenges that uh, apply uh, to every point. So uh, my research uh, looking at Sub-Saharan Africa um, 
Uh, today I'll be talking uh, a bit uh, with a, a, an agricultural transformation uh, lens. Uh, this idea uh, that many um, economic development scholars, uh, policy recommendations are founded on this idea uh, that what is necessary uh, for uh, development, what is necessary for uh, prosperity is an agricultural transformation. And specifically an agricultural transformation uh, in which uh, Farming in these rural communities in Sub-Saharan Africa goes from uh, being smallholder, subsistence-oriented uh, to being something that is more productive, uh, that is more commercialized, more engaged in selling things to the market as opposed to consuming food, uh, and that increasingly consists of off-farm activities, um, which is a, a, a relatively clean uh, way of saying which leads many, many, many more people to leave their farms to get off the farm to find alternative uh, livelihood. Uh, and it's talked about in the literature in terms of push factors and pull factors. Uh, and one of the reasons I wanted to start with this sort of long uh, uh, introduction is to put uh, into your uh, thinking that push factors, forcing people off of farms, and pull factors, providing incentives for people to move off of farms into things that they prefer or want more are very, very different things. And they're often not uh, talked about as being these very, very different things. Uh, that it's a very different thing to force a farmer to get off their land, to make uh, the economics of farming so difficult that people give up and move on than it is uh, to create pull factors, to create opportunities, to create uh, better choices for farmers uh, such that they voluntarily choose to do something different. So a lot of what I'll be talking about today is thinking about those two things uh, differently. Uh, uh, this uh, is a slide that we'll revisit a couple of times over the course of this talk. Uh, so this is a report uh, that came out from the MasterCard Foundation uh, just a couple of months ago um, with the uh, sort of glowing title, uh, Pathways to Prosperity. Uh, the idea uh, that we can now, um, with increasing availability of data, with increasing understanding uh, of uh, what individuals and households are doing, we can now map out those pathways that households can follow uh, that lead them to be more prosperous that lead them to be more engaged in markets, that lead them to be more engaged in off-farm livelihoods, that lead them to be wealthier, healthier, happier uh, individuals and uh, households. Uh, and what MasterCard Foundation does is they summarize it in this nice uh, infographic, uh, which again, uh, we'll revisit uh, a couple of times. But essentially, the idea is, here's the lowest point, a vulnerable subsistence farmer. In this case, uh, a woman. This is that undesirable status. This is that farmer who's just barely getting by. This is that farmer who doesn't have any surplus to sell. This is that farmer who doesn't have any resources to invest. Uh, this is uh, sort of the, the, the baseline, the position that we want to get out of. Where do you get out? Well. Maybe you become a resilient subsistence farmer. Maybe you become a more resilient but still subsistence farmer. You're still primarily consuming what you uh, produce. You're still uh, primarily uh, engaged in subsistence production, but you've got a little bit of a buffer, a little bit of resilience. Or maybe uh, you keep on going and you become a commercialized farmer who has a buffer and is also engaged in markets, who is also uh, starting to commercialize some of your production, who's also starting uh, to generate uh, some income and some investment. Uh, or maybe you keep right on going and you become intensified and consolidated and eventually a medium or a large scale farm. So this sort of axis of farming going from subsistence up to farming at larger scale and business is sort of one presumed pathway towards prosperity. Now, of course, in order to become medium to large scale farms, what has to happen? Well, you have to gobble up your neighbors, right? That land has to come from somewhere. Uh, and so thinking carefully about, well, in order for that pathway to happen, who has to leave? Who has to do something else? Um, well, where are all of those people who aren't uh, commercializing and intensifying their agriculture going? 
There's some pathways for those too. Maybe they become small entrepreneurs. Maybe they become enterprises in support of this new um, booming uh, agricultural sector. Maybe they become workers and they join the labor uh, force, the rural uh, labor force. Or maybe at any point in time, uh, at any of these stages, uh, you can give up on the whole thing and just move to the city. Nice summary set of pathways, nice sort of summary set of predictions about what development might uh, look like. We're going to start to pick apart some of the assumptions underneath uh, these. So, um, what we're talking about is uh, what are sustainable uh, escapes uh, from poverty. Um, my uh, colleague, uh, Lee Anderson at the University of Washington, uh, is fond of saying that we are in uh, an era uh, of the tyranny of the dashboard, uh, that we have increasing uh, availability of extraordinary detailed household micro data, and we're all falling all over ourselves to try to summarize them in the form of nice little infographics that sit on a screen. That, that, that condense uh, this complex micro data into these big, pretty fi figures that summarize massive trends uh, with a whole uh, lot of generalizability and very little uh, specificity. Um, so when you look uh, at things like uh, the Sustainable Development Goals for the four countries I'll be talking about today, Ethiopia, Nigeria, Tanzania, uh, Uganda, um, what you see uh, are uh, a whole lot of reds, a whole lot of sustainable development goals not achieved. What you see uh, are a whole lot of uh, red arrows or orange arrows. Uh, a downward red arrow means uh, falling backwards on that sustainable development goal. Uh, an orange uh, sideways arrow means uh, stagnant or no progress uh, on that uh, particular goal. Um, and we'll be focusing uh, today on uh, poverty, uh, zero hunger, uh, poverty, uh, zero hunger. Uh, just using these uh, to note uh, that by these uh, country level metrics, by these sustainable development goal uh, metrics, uh, the four countries we'll be talking about are countries that are uh, struggling uh, on uh, these goals uh, around hunger, around poverty uh, in a real and uh, persistent uh, way. Um, so we can break uh, those broad um, uh, sustainable development goals down into what their subcomponents uh, are. Uh, again, these are still pretty broad aggregates, uh, but what they do uh, do is they allow you to say, oh, look, there are some metrics related to hunger, some metrics related to poverty, where there has been progress. Um, you can look uh, at uh, the uh, SDG2 goal of zero hunger in Ethiopia, and you can note that there are three uh, of these. Uh, goals where substantial progress is made, three subcomponents where substantial progress is being made, two uh, where there's not. Uh, that in no case uh, are we looking at contexts where um, everything uh, is uh, in the negative, everything is in the red. Uh, what that means is uh, progress depends on how you measure progress. Uh, that what uh, you conclude uh, about uh, uh, the status of a country in terms of poverty, the status of a country in terms of nutrition, uh, will depend on how you decide to measure poverty, how you decide uh, to measure uh, nutrition. Um, so let's look at a couple of uh, sort of familiar metrics uh, to uh, the Tufts uh, uh, University environment, uh, where uh, we've got uh, progress against malnutrition uh, in Ethiopia, as reported uh, by the USAID uh, Demographic and Health uh, Surveys, um, looking back across multiple uh, survey waves. Um, what you can see is, again, uh, depending on the metric uh, that you would use, uh, stunting, underweight, uh, or wasting, uh, you would conclude either that there's been uh, pretty tremendous uh, progress uh, in terms of reductions in stunting uh, since 2005, uh, or that there's been you know, relatively uh, modest but still meaningful uh, progress. Uh, in some of these other uh, metrics. Um, but if you keep uh, slicing and dicing these data, if you start saying, well, we aren't just interested in the national overall aggregate trend, we're interested in differences within countries, we're interested in uh, who is winning and who is losing, uh, what you can see is that in Ethiopia, uh, there are huge disparities in urban outcomes versus rural outcomes uh, that have persisted throughout this period of uh, progress. There have been tremendous gains 
tremendous achievements in rural communities, but uh, when you look at uh, metrics like um, uh, stunting, which is uh, two degrees um, uh, below uh, two standard deviations uh, below the median, uh, or severe uh, stunting, three standard deviations below uh, the median, uh, weight per age, all of these metrics show uh, that in rural uh, communities you're still doing worse, uh, and sometimes far worse, uh, than in uh, urban uh, communities. Uh, when you look uh, at the spatial distribution uh, of uh, progress or lack uh, of progress uh, on sustainable development goals, on uh, nutritional achievements, uh, what you end up seeing is uh, here in Nigeria, uh, tremendous uh, 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 successes uh, in many regions uh, uh, against uh, these types of malnutrition, but persistent, persistent <laughs> threats. Uh, in uh, particularly more remote, more isolated, more uh, rural areas. There, there, there is uh, a set of winners and there is a set of uh, losers. Uh, progress is not even. Uh, things are different in different places. Um, now, um, there's a lot of uh, reasons for, for, for this. Um, one uh, comment that uh, my colleague Ayala uh, Weinman makes that I, that I love uh, is that uh, a lot of the discrepancies between urban outcomes and rural outcomes might relate to how we define uh, urban and rural. And in particular, uh, that uh, policymakers <laughs> uh, will often make this choice of uh, defining an area that has an economic center, that has trade, that has growth, that has population density as urban which means that every time a rural area starts to develop and starts to realize some successes, it gets reclassified as an urban area. <laughs> and so you consistently see uh, rural areas lagging behind. Uh, but uh, that doesn't explain all of it. Uh, we're very much seeing uh, areas uh, of gain, areas of uh, not uh, gain. Uh, same deal in uh, Uganda, national trends show uh, uh, tremendous progress, uh, but there's huge differences, huge variation. Uh, and in particular, the thing I like to emphasize about Uganda is there's a temporal element uh, to this uh, where that nice straight line of progress is hiding a whole lot of back and forth. Uh, and a whole lot of back and forth in particular uh, in, the, uh, in the Ugandan poverty uh, assessment. Um, there was a, a study showed um, that you know, in a context where you have tremendous gains against poverty, falling from 62% in 2002 to 35% in 2012, so one of the fastest sets of reduction in poverty, just extraordinary, extraordinary gains. When you go back and look at the numbers again, what you start to realize is that for every three Ugandans who came out of poverty, another two fell back. And so you start uh, to recognize uh, that it's not uh, this even trajectory, not this even pathway uh, towards prosperity. It's, it's, a, it's a jittering. It's a moving forward and falling back. It's a trying to advance, but also trying not to lose what gains you've been able uh, to accumulate. So uh, the structure of the examples uh, that I'll be giving here are uh, basically broken down into uh, these three uh, bullet points. Uh, I think we can characterize uh, smallholder farmer behavior in uh, rural uh, communities uh, as being a function of what is ecologically feasible, what is socially acceptable, what is economically uh, desirable. And so we'll be breaking down uh, the new types of data, the new types of information that are available uh, to help us better understand what's ecologically feasible, what is socially acceptable, what is uh, economically uh, desirable. Uh, just sort of the bullet point takeaways here uh, on the ecological feasibility front. Remote sensing is so much fun. There are extraordinary new sources of remotely sensed data on land cover, on climate, on uh, variability in rainfall, uh, but also on social data, on population density and, and things like nighttime lights as measurements of uh, economic activity. Just ex extraordinary, extraordinary resources uh, out there. But if you don't have the ground data, you miss a lot. And we'll be talking about some of the things that you would miss uh, using just remote sensing data. Second, uh, farmer livelihood uh, choices take place within an ecological and a social uh, context. Uh, 
Uh, so uh, the decisions that individuals make, that households make, that farms uh, make, are constrained by what is ecologically feasible, but they're also very much shaped uh, by the uh, socio-institutional constraints on what is appropriate, what is desired, what is possible um, from uh, a cultural uh, or a social uh, standpoint. Uh, last, uh, farm portfolios and livelihood strategies include a complex and highly variable mix of on-farm and off-farm activities. Uh, again, uh, starting to think uh, about the decisions that farmers are making not as following this clear-cut pathway, uh, but as moving ahead a little bit and falling back some. As moving forward and trying not uh, to lose uh, ground, uh, as being in this dynamic process uh, with uh, a lot of uh, different pathways and a lot of different directions uh, that farmers are uh, moving uh, along. Uh, a theme throughout uh, all of these examples that are about to follow uh, is that data availability is increasing, uh, but data accessibility uh, also matters. Uh, that there's a lot that we can do and a lot that you can do as uh, students uh, entering into this field uh, to make uh, these complex data sets more accessible, more usable, uh, particularly for the people in the low and middle income countries that we're talking about. Uh, not uh, just uh, restricting these data sets uh, to ourselves. So, what is ecologically feasible? Um, again, starting from this uh, image, uh, what uh, I see here, uh, and this is somewhat common in uh, these, these reports on, on pathways to prosperity or, or uh, uh, yeah, development uh, uh, opportunities, uh, is a big, dense, beautiful field, also a big, dense monoculture, also a whole lot of land. When you look over at this image, you also have just sort of that bright green, happy background. We're on a hillside deciding what to do. We will move to the city. These are the landscapes that I'm used to working with. So this is northern Ethiopia. Um, we're here on the eastern coast of Lake Tana. Uh, Lake Tana is the headwaters of uh, the Blue Nile, uh, so the source of most of the water that goes into the Nile River. Uh, right now, highly uh, politically contentious uh, as Ethiopia is building a large hydroelectric dam uh, on uh, the Blue Nile. Uh, now, disputes with uh, Egypt, with Sudan, over the right to the rainwater that falls in Ethiopia. Uh, extraordinary, interesting place uh, in the world. Uh, what I want folks to note is just there's there's not a lot of resources in this extraordinary landscape. I study forests. You are looking at a landscape that is more than 95 to 98 percent uh, deforested, that, that has not had forests for a long time. Um, Lake Tana is the largest freshwater body in Ethiopia. Uh, it's a biodiversity uh, hotspot. Uh, it was recently registered as a UNESCO Biosphere Reserve, which was extraordinary in part because it's a basin that has 3 million people in it. Uh, it is the most densely populated biosphere reserve uh, on uh, the record of biospheres and uh, reserves. Uh, so it is an intensely um, uh, used uh, landscape. Uh, and when you look around, what you're starting to see is a whole lot of not big green hillsides, very, very small land parcels uh, that are available to these individual farmers uh, trying to uh, produce uh, food, often uh, just at subsistence levels, uh, from uh, this particular landscape. But what you also see, if you look really closely, are a whole bunch of these little green dots. And these little green dots are exception after exception after exception uh, to uh, this pattern of land degradation and land clearing, this pattern of deforestation and, 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 and a treeless landscape. Uh, each one of these, uh, if you keep on zooming in, uh, has an Ethiopian Orthodox Tewahedo church in the center of it. These are church forests that are safeguarded uh, by community after community after community after community all across the northern Ethiopian highlands. Uh, these are uh, little um, 
patches of indigenous Afro-Montane forest that are conserved by communities as prayer spaces, um, but also as sources of fodder and uh, fuel wood and fruit and other uh, community benefits. There are these little patches of community managed uh, forest that are all across uh, the highway. Why am I excited about this? Apart from them being extraordinary, what they also do uh, is they provide uh, an extraordinary amount of information about what is ecologically feasible in this landscape. So uh, there are reportedly as many as 35,000 uh, churches uh, across uh, Ethiopia. Uh, the Ethiopian Orthodox Tewahedo Church is, is um, one of the oldest uh, Christian churches in the world, uh, the earliest records uh, dating back uh, to uh, 27 uh, AD. Like zero to seven uh, for uh, Christianity in this uh, area. Um, what we've been doing, uh, working uh, with uh, local partners at Bahadur University and Deborah Sabor University, uh, working with the students that I mentioned uh, earlier on, uh, is a, a series of studies uh, looking at uh, these little forest patches uh, as uh, examples, uh, again, of what is uh, ecologically feasible uh, in these different areas of uh, northern Ethiopia. Uh, so particularly, uh, we've been doing remote sensing analyses, looking at how dense uh, is the vegetation in these forest patches surrounding uh, these churches. Uh, we've done field studies um, looking at the tree species diversity and the woody species diversity and the insect diversity uh, within uh, the forest patches. So what are the types of diversity that can be supported in those forests? We've done a series of ecological studies looking at ecosystem services flows that come out of forests, looking at hydrological services, looking at pollination services, looking at impacts on surrounding farm fields. Uh, and we've done a series of household surveys and interviews, uh, basically trying to understand uh, why do you have some forests that are hundreds of hectares and some forests that are five hectares? What can we learn about community-based natural resource management from uh, this extraordinary system? Um, so just uh, some quick summary uh, results. Uh, when we've uh, gone through uh, doing systematic uh, searches using Google Earth Pro high-resolution data, you can now go through the northern Ethiopian highlands and grid the whole thing out. And we've done this and put student teams on uh, going through each grid and identifying the church forests that are present and tracing the size and the outlines. Um, but we can also go back in time uh, and we can use uh, these new repositories uh, of uh, spatial data, free, publicly accessible spatial data uh, to look at uh, vegetation density using things like the normalized difference vegetation index uh, to track uh, what is uh, the vegetation productivity of these forest patches over time. What are the uh, productivity trends in the landscapes surrounding different forests in different uh, places? Um, and we can go actually as far back as the 1960s. Uh, fun little story here. Uh, during uh, the 1960s, the United States government flew spy plane expeditions over this part of uh, Ethiopia. And so what we've been doing here is patching together uh, from uh, black and white film uh, images from these spy planes of uh, what these forests actually looked like uh, 50, 60 uh, years ago. So you can get these really uh, extraordinary uh, long time series uh, images of A, what the forest looked like, but B, what the landscape around uh, the forest uh, looked like throughout these periods of time. So, how many? We found over 12,000 um, uh, of uh, these church forests scattered all across uh, the northern Ethiopian highlands. Uh, there are church forests at every latitude, every longitude, every elevation all across uh, the northern Ethiopian highlands. Uh, these are little libraries uh, of uh, the di biodiversity that could be at each of those different locations. These are little natural experiments of what uh, soil uh, potential could be, of what hydrological services could be, uh, of what uh, is ecologically feasible in these uh, different uh, landscapes. So you, again, uh, we're not looking at uh, pristine, perfect, uniform forests all across the landscape. A lot of these are heavily degraded. A lot of these are heavily degraded by uh, the farmers uh, encroaching on uh, the outside. Um, but um, what you can do uh, is uh, describe uh, uh, using uh, your, your combination of remote sensing, uh, field survey, and uh, community uh, 
level uh, data collection is, is you can use these um, examples to say uh, this is uh, what your landscape uh, is capable of uh, sustaining. Uh, this is uh, the type of tree species that can grow here. Uh, these are the types of ecosystem services that could be realized if you expanded uh, the uh, forest uh, potential. Uh, these 1960s images are just so cool, but the thing that I want to uh, really emphasize here uh, is that uh, this uh, is a 1960s uh, image uh, of a riparian area with a lot of trees around it, of some farmland, with a lot of scattered trees in it, and of course that large anchor church forest that sort of gives us a reference point for, for uh, seeing where we are, for, for seeing um, something that might be stable in the landscape. This is what it looks like today. And just to go back and forth on this, th th these uh, kinds of uh, trends, these kinds of changes in landscape have extraordinary consequences. Uh, for what is uh, ecologically feasible uh, for uh, agricultural producers. So what I want you to look at is up in this area. Can you sort of get a sense of what the size of land holdings was in the 1960s in this part of northern Ethiopia? How about today? All of those parcels have been divided up and divided in half and divided in quarters and divided in thirds. And that pattern has happened, uh, again, all across uh, this part of uh, northern Ethiopia. Uh, when we say what is ecologically feasible, what is ecologically possible to grow, that's partly a function of how much land you have. And the farmers in this particular area just have less and less land year upon year upon year. Um, so I'm excited about uh, research on uh, church forests, uh, in part, again, because it's an inspirational story, community-based conservation, extraordinary uh, institution, uh, but also because it provides a whole lot of data uh, in a very data-poor uh, system. Uh, a whole lot of uh, potential uh, to combine uh, these thousands of different points uh, where we know uh, what uh, uh, tree species can grow, where we know what vegetation density is possible, with a whole bunch of other geographic information systems data on population density trends and livestock density trends, on climate trends, on uh, uh, any, any kind um, of uh, ecological variables that you might be interested in, uh, to be able to do things like make longer term uh, models of how climate change, changing land use patterns, uh, environmental degradation has been impacting uh, households uh, in these areas. Um, so we've again done some of these tests, we've published some of these uh, results, we've shown uh, that uh, church forests that have more uh, species diversity in terms of tree species also sequester more carbon that uh, more diverse plantings uh, have um, climate benefits uh, that can extend uh, beyond uh, just uh, 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 what uh, planting a patch of eucalyptus or a patch of, of, uh, of, of homogenous trees uh, can do. Um, we've done our biodiversity surveys, uh, and we noted <laughs> that it's not just uh, biodiversity within these forest patches is that the presence of a forest patch as a hub of biodiversity enhances the biodiversity of a landscape. Uh, there's a lot of debates in ecology about whether you want uh, uh, several, uh, single large or several small, uh, whether you want one large conserved forest area or you want a whole bunch of tiny little patches that sort of create a landscape where a bunch of diversity can persist. We've got experiments out there <laughs> of uh, patches in landscape and can start to talk about uh, what are the ecological benefits, uh, what are the benefits in terms of pollination, what are the costs in terms of pests that might predate on farmers' crops and crop fields uh, from these extraordinary systems. Uh, again, I mentioned water. We've actually done uh, testing uh, where you can see a stream that flows into the top of a forest patch and then it flows out the bottom of the forest patch and you can monitor that water quality as it improves. You can say things like not just it's good to plant trees along your riparian zones, you should plant some of those trees. You can say if you plant trees in these mixtures along these zones in these different areas, these are the types of benefits quantifiable that you could realize. Uh, again, um, the extraordinary story uh, here is uh, an institutional one. Uh, a lot of uh, what's exciting about church force is this fact that there's a little passage in 
uh, this uh, Ethiopian Orthodox Tarahedo version of the Bible that does say, uh, the church on the earth signifies and symbolizes the new heaven, the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven. Thus it should have the same semblance and appearance as Eden. It just sounds like a religious passage, right? But it's a religious passage that has been interpreted over centuries as it's not a church if it doesn't have an indigenous forest around it. That is a powerful institution. That is a powerful sense of, of what uh, is right, of what is uh, appropriate, uh, that has shaped uh, these landscapes, that has led to these forest patches uh, remaining uh, for all uh, of this time. Uh, a church without a forest uh, is like a man without clothes. So again, um, extraordinary opportunities, uh, ecologically fascinating, socially fascinating. Uh, all of the data um, that we have been um, gathering uh, are publicly available. If folks want the, the thousands of church forest points, you can have the thousands of church forest points. If you want the outlines, you can have the outlines. If you want uh, all of uh, the data sets uh, that we've tied to these various points, uh, each time my students and I do an analysis, uh, we make a tutorial showing how we did that analysis. And we're using these tutorials as training materials for our partners in Ethiopia. If you wanted to teach me geographic information systems uh, 10 years ago, uh, and you had examples of maple syrup, GIS, I would have been all over that. Having these local examples having these things that people can relate to uh, is one way uh, to uh, make these types of extraordinary geospatial data more accessible so that more people can uh, use them. Okay, what is socially acceptable? So we've talked about what is ecologically feasible. Uh, what is ecologically feasible and how what is ecologically feasible has dramatically declined and degraded over uh, time. Now we're talking about what is socially acceptable. Well, again, in this uh, image, we've got pathways to prosperity. We've got women. We've got men. We've got men. We've got women. As if they're interchangeable. As if the pathways to prosperity are pathways to prosperity for everyone. As if the track is the same. As if the goal and the steps are the same for everyone. One of the things that we can start doing now uh, is we can start really revising uh, our theories and our understanding uh, of uh, not just uh, what are the pathways for people to realize increased commercialization, for people to realize increased market access, for people to realize increased off-farm uh, activities, but we can start to say, maybe this model makes sense for some people, but what are the pathways that allow people to do what they want. Uh, and in particular, uh, this line of research with Biodiversity International has been looking at how uh, preferences uh, for crops, how preferences for what crops to grow, and how preferences for whether to engage in market channels or not uh, vary uh, dramatically across uh, men and women uh, farmers. Um, so, do women and men uh, want uh, the same things? Uh, some questions we've been asking with this line of research. Do female and male-headed households make different crop choices? Uh, do differences in crop choices uh, persist after you account for differences in resource constraints? If men and women are making different choices, but they're just making different choices because women have fewer resources, if women had more resources, they would want to use the same markets and use the same inputs and grow the same crops that the men would, then the questions are not interesting. Um, do female and male-headed households differ in the importance they place on crops for home consumption versus crops they grow for income? If we're interested in nutritional outcomes, if we're interested in supporting the poorest of the poor, and we recognize that uh, smallholder remote households with limited access to markets disproportionately consume what they produce, then these decisions about what a household is producing can have real repercussions for nutrition, for household uh, welfare. Um, Spoiler alert, the answer to everything here is yes. Uh, but <laughs> uh, there are uh, differences between men and women. That these differences persist, uh, that these differences have uh, implications uh, for uh, what households produce and consume.
too. Um, so uh, the data here is a sample of 1,001 smallholder households collected through network survey uh, analyses. Um, and so it's, uh, you interview a farmer, and then you speak to that uh, farmer and get a list of all of the people that that farmer interacts with. And then you interview all of the people that th those farmers uh, interact with, and you interview all the people that those farmers interact with. And you get these uh, webs uh, of information exchange and seed exchange and knowledge exchange um, that help uh, you understand uh, basically how uh, individuals and households make uh, cropping decisions, but how they make cropping decisions within a social uh, context. Uh, a little technology shout out here. All of the data uh, for this particular study were collected using uh, Open Data uh, Kit, uh, which is an extraordinary tool. It's basically a, a pre coded uh, survey that's on a tablet where you enter the data into the tablet, and then as soon as that tablet is in within a uh, range of an internet signal, all of the data that you've entered is backed up on a central database. Um, all of uh, the information uh, that you've entered in terms of things like people's names or the spellings of different local crops are entered into that database so that they become prompts for the next person who's doing the survey. It's a way of sort of cleaning your data as you go. It's an extraordinary tool and encourage folks to explore it. Um, what do we find? One, we find that men grow more crops. We did not expect to find that men uh, grow more uh, diverse combinations of crops. Uh, a lot of the narrative uh, is women are the stewards of agrobiodiversity. We'd expected to find that women would be the stewards of agrobiodiversity. Instead, uh, we find men uh, grow more crops in Kenya, in Tanzania, in Uganda, uh, across the board. Uh, men have uh, more diverse crop portfolios. Um, turns out that men have more crops because men have more land. That when you start to control for the fact that male-headed households have greater access to land, have greater access to resources, what you start to see is uh, that those um, males who are in uh, the lowest uh, uh, deciles of land holding, who have the smallest uh, amount of land holding in the sample, tend to grow as few crops as the women who are in the lowest uh, deciles of land holding. But that small number of women who are in the highest deciles of land holding grow just as many or even in some cases more uh, crops per hectare of land to which they have access than uh, men. So there is a resource constraint uh, story here. Uh, there is also very much a uh, difference in preferences between uh, men and women. Women appear to choose to cultivate more diverse crop portfolios uh, on uh, the smaller amounts of land uh, that they have uh, to which they have access. Uh, now, what we can't do is really say uh, whether women are growing more diverse crop portfolios as sort of an adaptation strategy, as, as sort of a, a, a way to cope uh, with having that smaller patch of land. So they have only a little bit of land they need to cover their major food groups, so they, they you know, don't want to grow that diversity. They grow that diversity because they feel they have to, that it's a, a coping strategy, a way to deal with the problem. But we asked uh, <laughs> whether uh, that was the case. We, we asked the question on, on the survey, why do you grow the crops that you grow? And at least in their self-reports, women self-report that they prefer to grow diverse crops uh, for consumption, that they prefer to grow these mixtures uh, of crops uh, for uh, the benefit of uh, their household, that they are more interested in uh, growing uh, additional uh, food crops rather than cash crops destined for markets. So at least uh, from what uh, women say, uh, women uh, want uh, different things uh, than men. Uh, the takeaway uh, from this uh, little arc is that when we think about uh, incentives for farmers as if all farmers are the same, when we think about transformation pathways as if everybody's following the same path, what we are potentially doing is incentivizing women or supporting women or empowering women to act like men rather than supporting women and empowering women to do what they want. If we don't ask what they want, if we don't understand what they want, then the incentives might be empowering them to do something that is not in their interest, not in their goals, not what they're hoping for. 
uh, I summarize this to my students, it, 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 uh, takes no, uh, give a poor man a fish, he'll eat uh, for a day, teach a poor man to fish, he'll eat for a lifetime. Ask a poor family what they want to eat, and it might not be fish. And we can ask. We, we have uh, the opportunity now to ask these kinds of questions, to set different goals uh, through uh, our work. Lastly, uh, what is economically desirable? So at the end of the day, everything uh, that uh, uh, happens uh, in a rural community is a function of the decisions that individuals and households make. At the end of the day, within these broad ecological constraints, within these social constraints, farmers are making choices, making decisions. And so this question, what is economically desirable? What do farmers uh, choose uh, to do? What uh, mix uh, of crops do they choose to plant? Uh, what a combination of on-farm activities and off-farm activities do they engage in? These are, these are economic questions. And what we can do now uh, is uh, we can use some of these large-scale data sets, uh, like uh, the World Bank Living Standards Measurement Study, uh, to study what uh, decisions do farmers make, what choices do farmers make, what do these portfolios actually look like, and where do they move uh, along these uh, hypothesized pathways to prosperity. Uh, so two uh, indicators that I'll be showing right here. Uh, one uh, is agricultural commercialization. Uh, you can think about commercialization is are you doubling down on farming? Are you, um, what Dorward uh, uh, sort of famously summarized uh, as, uh, are you uh, stepping up in uh, agriculture? Are you investing in your agricultural production? Are you becoming a bigger farmer? Are you uh, selling more uh, into um, uh, markets? Uh, and then income diversification uh, is uh, another metric uh, of what an agricultural transformation might look like. Um, are you shifting away from agriculture? Are you engaging in more off-farm activities? Are you engaging in these alternative livelihood uh, paths? Um, and what we have uh, here is a, is a nice framework that was put forward by uh, the Alliance for Green Revolution in Africa in 2017 that said, well, we can think about households that commercialize. We can think about households that diversify. We can think about uh, classifying households uh, at, in terms of their livelihood portfolios as being uh, low uh, sales or medium sales or high sales as being a uh, low uh, off-farm income or high off-farm income. And we can even come up with some nice little names like, well, someone who hardly engages in markets at all is a subsistence farmer. Someone uh, who engages in markets a lot and has a lot of off-farm income sources is a diversified commercial farmer. Someone who has really doubled down on agriculture alone is a specialized commercial farmer. Someone who is trying to get out of agriculture is a transitioning household, someone who's increasingly getting off-farm income and not really marketing a whole lot of what they produce. There, there, there's some nice sort of intuitive categories here. And what uh, AGRA gives us uh, are some projections uh, about what we would expect to see in an economy uh, if uh, an agricultural transformation is uh, taking place. Um, so. Uh, Hazel uh, summarizes what the predicted uh, transitions would be uh, as follows. That over time, subsistence farms should either become transition pre-commercial or commercial. Remember that corner? Being a subsistence farmer is the worst outcome. They should become something else. Uh, pre uh, many transition farms should become commercial farms or successfully move uh, to the non-farm category. Again, transitioning. You should be stepping out. You should be transitioning to something else. Um, four, uh, commercial farms should either prosper as such or become large holders. Pre-commercial farmers should either succeed and become commercial farmers or diversify and become transition farmers. So there, there are some clear directions that are hypothesized here that are just like the directions hypothesized in that Max Richard figure of, of what progress uh, looks like. Um, what the World Bank LSMS uh, allows us to do is look at the same individual households over multiple years. 
and see do they actually follow these predicted trajectories? Do households actually uh, step up uh, or step out? Uh, do households uh, follow on this? ladder on this progression uh, towards increasing prosperity and what are the factors that are associated with households successfully uh, transitioning into uh, superior uh, outcomes. So uh, in aggregate we can look at our nice uh, dashboard. This is the dashboard summary of those agri categories uh, in Ethiopia across three waves of LSMS data, in Nigeria three waves of LSMS data, Tanzania three waves of LSMS data. Uh, and what do we see? hard to see anything in the dashboard. Uh, what we see <laughs> um, is maybe uh, some signs uh, that this non-farming category is getting smaller in Ethiopia. What does that mean? That means there's a bunch of people who entered back into agriculture. That's not supposed to happen. We look over here on the other extreme, the large holder category. Doesn't seem to be booming in Ethiopia. Doesn't seem to be booming or growing in Tanzania. And hey, it's getting smaller in Nigeria. Wait a minute. The large holders are becoming small holders in Nigeria. What's the puzzle? What's, what's happening? We, we don't clearly see a, a, a trend of this uh, subsistence farmers becoming more successful. Um, we can map these out. We can combine them with all our extraordinary geospatial data. This is a map uh, that shows uh, the location of subsistence farmers in relation to uh, transportation access and uh, land productivity. So somebody who's on an orange pixel is in uh, close proximity to a market to sell their products and is in high productivity land. We might predict uh, that subsistence farmers would be in more remote areas, further from markets, on lower quality land. Uh, that uh, specialized or diversified farmers, heavily uh, invested uh, doubling down farmers, might be in uh, transportation corridors or might be on high productivity land. You could squint at it. We did some statistics. Yeah, maybe there's a little bit of a pattern where if it's low quality land, far from markets, you're more likely to be a subsistence farmer. If it's high quality land, close to markets, but especially if it's close to markets, regardless of the quality of land you're more likely to be uh, a commercial farmer. But we also see this, which is in wave one, here's where all the subsistence farmers are. And in wave three, here's where all the subsistence farmers are. You see what's happening? They're all over the place. They're moving. Why are they moving? Because households are not following these trajectories in any kind of consistent way that we might expect. What this chart shows is that it is very rare for households to be classified as a subsistence farmer in wave one and be classified as a subsistence farmer in wave three. It is very rare for households to make the predicted progressions be being a subsistence farmer in wave one, being in a higher commercialization or higher diversification or off-farm category uh, in um, wave uh, three. The, pa the patterns, the trends don't emerge uh, from the data. It's, it's more consistent with a bit of a scattershot with households are all over the place. These are the transitions that we see. Small holders become large holders, become small holders. Subsistence becomes pre commercial, becomes commercial. Pre commercial becomes subsistence. People move back and forth all over the place. What we actually um, find two sort of big takeaways one is less than 2% of households are classified as subsistence farmers in all three waves of the LSMS survey data. When you take a snapshot, you're capturing a bunch of people and calling them subsistence farmers, but two years later, they might not be. Between 25 and 33% of households are subsistence farmers at least once in three waves of the LSMS survey data. 
If you just take a single snapshot in time, you're missing all of these farm households who might be vulnerable to falling into statistics. It's not this neat and tidy pathway. It's a lot of movement. It's a lot of give and take. It's a lot of diversity and livelihood strategies. And a big piece of this that relates to the ecological, that relates to the social, is something that Ellis put forward which is that it's very difficult for us as researchers to tease apart diversification and commercialization of opportunity and diversification and commercialization of desperation. Are you selling most of what you produce because you want to sell most of what you produce? Or are you selling most of what you produce because you had a really bad year and you didn't produce much of anything and you don't have any choice but to sell it and hope for the best? And so what we as researchers need to do is start teasing those things uh, apart. EPAR is really trying to help us tease those things apart. As I said, all of the data used uh, for monitoring, for categorizing, for classifying these farmers, for tracking things over time, uh, all of these codes are posted, freely available, download them, use them, cite them, make them better, and send them back, uh, advance uh, the collective body of uh, knowledge uh, on uh, these topics. These links will all be uh, posted here. Um, I just want to conclude uh, with a statement uh, that my colleague uh, Atala Wubul and Nadu made uh, last week um, uh, when I was doing a, a workshop training in, in northern Ethiopia. And uh, he said, all of these data are really wonderful. All of this research is very exciting. But we know why these people are poor. These farmers are poor because they have nothing. And they have nothing because their parents had nothing. They inherited land that was degraded and that they don't own and can't invest in. Climate change is making it worse. When they do make a little bit of extra money, they don't invest it in themselves. They use it to help their children or to help a neighbor who's having a worse year than they're having. These farmers are making the best decisions that they can, but there are not many decisions that they can make. What are we doing to help them? We are at the end of our time. Um, let's, uh, if you have questions for Travis, I encourage you to catch him as the group uh, goes out to lunch. Um, but thank you so much for a wonderful presentation and for sharing your social location and all of the work that you're doing. So thank you again.